Hello, everybody. Congratulations. We've made it through electricity and magnetism. Unless, of course, you plan on retaking the test. And in that case, you're almost done with it, but not quite. Today, we're going to start looking at our final unit of study. We are going to start talking about vibrations and waves, and this is going to carry us through the end of the year. So we're almost there, folks. In this unit, we're going to be looking at things like uh, vibrations, uh, simple harmonic motion, pendulums. We're going to take a look at sound. We are going to explore light in the electromagnetic spectrum, and we are going to end with geometric optics. We are going to look at reflection in mirrors and refraction and lenses. So uh, let's get started. And by the way, this video is brought to you by chips and salsa. All right, let's go. By the way, I should have said that this video is sponsored by chips and salsa and a whole lot of heartburn medication. But the first thing that we want to talk about when we talk about waves is a, a principle called Hooke's Law. And the formula for Hooke's Law is right here. Hold on, let me get my pen going here. So this is Hooke's Law. It's a pretty simple formula. And it says that the force on a spring is equal to the negative of K, which is my spring constant, times X, which is the displacement of the spring from equilibrium. So F sub S, let me do a little ratio here. F sub S is the spring force. Hold on here, let me see that. That is the spring force. K is the spring constant, and we talked about the spring constant when we talked about elastic potential energy, so the spring constant is not new. A couple of things about the spring constant. Remember that just as before, the spring constant is different for all different types of elastic materials. So it's going to be a different spring constant for different types of elastic materials. And we use the, um, the units of newtons per meter for our spring constants. And X is our displacement in meters, and it is the displacement from the equilibrium position. If I have an elastic material, I don't have any springs handy, but I do have one of Emerson's hair ties. And this is the equilibrium position for the hair tie. If I stretch it, I am displacing it from its equilibrium position. So if I stretch it, hold my the top of it steady, and I pull the bottom of it downward, I am displacing it from its equilibrium position. That is going to be my value for max. How far is it from equilibrium? And we always say that equilibrium position is equal to zero. And the other thing I want to point out is this negative sign in the formula simply means that my force is always going to be in the opposite direction of the displacement. So if you think about what's happening with my hair tie, as I displace it downward, so I am causing a downward displacement, the force is pushing it back upwards. It wants to go back to the equilibrium position, which was upward. So in this case, my displacement is negative. My force is positive or in the upward direction. If I were to hold it horizontally, keep this side of it um, constant and pull on this side, my displacement is to your left but the force wants to pull it back to the right. So that's all that negative sign means. It means that the displacement is in the opposite direction of the force. One more note about the force for Hooke's Law. Because the displacement is always away from the equilibrium position, right? If I have my hair tie and I displace it away from my equilibrium position, because the force is acting in the opposite direction of the displacement, the force is always going towards or is always oriented toward the equilibrium position. Because the force is always oriented toward the equilibrium position, we call it a restoring force. So the object is always being pushed or pulled back towards its equilibrium position, right? If you stretch something that's elastic, we want it's going to want to move back towards its equilibrium position. No matter how you stretch it, it always wants to go back to equilibrium. And by the way, we call it the spring constant. We use springs as a default, but this applies to any type of elastic material. So it could be a spring, it could be a rubber band, 
anything that's elastic will follow Hooke's law. Let's take a look at a special case of Hooke's law. If we have a mass that is attached to the end of a spring, so that's what we have in the diagram. If I take that spring and I stretch it to the right, so my displacement is to the right, the force that's going to be acting on the spring is going to be going to back toward the equilibrium position, which is to the left. So the displacement is to the right, the force is to the left. If after I've displaced it by a certain amount, x here, if I let go of this mass, so if I want to now release this mass and let it go back to the right, let's take a look and, and see what's going to be uh, happening with the mass. When I release the mass, its initial velocity is going to be zero, and the force is going to be at its maximum. So as I release it and it starts to move back towards the equilibrium position, so as it begins to move back towards the equilibrium position, the displacement is going to start to decrease. And because the force is, um, is uh, proportional to the displacement, the force is going to decrease, but the velocity is going to increase because as it keeps moving, it's going to start moving faster and faster. When it gets back to the equilibrium position, the force acting on it at that moment is zero. The displacement is zero, but it's moving and it's moving at its greatest velocity. And because it's moving, it has momentum. Remember, momentum equals mass times velocity. So its momentum is going to carry the mass past the equilibrium position. So it's going to go past the equilibrium position. And now it's going to have a displacement to the left, which is what we have in the bottom picture. And when the displacement is to the left, now the restoring force is going to be acting in the opposite direction. So the restoring force is now going to be acting towards the right. So when it gets to its maximum displacement, that force is going to push it back to its equilibrium position. And now the mass is going to want to start moving back in the direction of the force to the right. Again, when it gets to the equilibrium position, the force is going to equal zero because the displacement is going to equal zero, but its velocity is going to be at its maximum. So it's going to overshoot the equilibrium position. That's why if you stretch something on a spring and you let it go, the spring will kind of bounce a little bit until it finally settles down and comes to a rest. Let's define simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion occurs when you have the motion of an object that occurs because the force is proportional to the displacement of the object and the force is always directed back toward the equilibrium position. So you have to have two things occurring here. You have to have the force always oriented toward the equilibrium position and the force has to be proportional to the displacement. In other words, the bigger the displacement, the greater the force. The smaller the displacement, the smaller the force. If you have those two things working together, you have a simple harmonic motion. A great example of simple harmonic motion, one that we're going to take a look at in much more detail later on, are pendulums. One thing to keep in mind is that not all back and forth motion or periodic motion is simple harmonic motion. There are certain periodic motions like pacing back and forth or the revolution of the earth around the sun that count as periodic motion, but they don't obey Hooke's law, so they're not considered simple harmonic motion. This slide is just a recap of the previous couple of slides, just reiterating that simple harmonic motion is motion that occurs when the net force is proportional to displacement and always directed back towards an equilibrium position, and that not all periodic motion counts as simple harmonic motion. We mentioned that a pendulum is a great example of simple harmonic motion, so I want to just take a moment and talk about what a pendulum is, how it works. I have a free body diagram here. Don't get all crazy PTSD on me here. I'm not going to make you do free body diagrams. Probably the last time we're going to have to look at one, but I'm just using this as an example just to demonstrate the forces acting on a pendulum and why this is a simple harmonic motion. So at my equilibrium position for a pendulum is when it is oriented straight downward. As I 
pull, hold on, my pen's not working here, as I pull my pendulum or the bob of the pendulum off to one side, because it's not going straight down, it's following the arc of a circle, it's elevated slightly off of the ground. So when I release it, when I release the pendulum, gravity wants to pull it straight down. Whoops, let me get the highlighter here, sorry. Gravity wants to pull it straight down but it can't go straight down because of the tension in the string here. So there's going to be another force that's going to be pulling it back toward the equilibrium position. That's my restoring force. That's why a pendulum is a good example of a simple harmonic motion because it's going to follow this periodic motion back and forth um, until friction or some other, um, some other dissipating force causes it to stop. Let's take a look at the period of a pendulum. Now remember, a period is the amount of time it takes for an object to undergo one complete cycle of motion, one complete back and forth cycle. So if I have a pendulum here and I pull it back this way, a period is going to be how long it takes for it to swing to the opposite side and then come all the way back. That's one period, one complete back and forth motion. And the period is equal to two pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by the gravitational acceleration. So L, capital L, is the length of the pendulum in meters g is our gravitational acceleration if it's on earth we're going to say it's 9.80 meters per second squared if it's somewhere else i'll let you know what the value of g is or ask you to find it and the variable t is our period so t is period now you can think of that as time because it's how long does it take to undergo one complete cycle or back and forth motion so we always measure our period in seconds and we've used uh, this variable before when we were talking about Kepler's laws of gravitational motion. A couple of things to note about this formula. Note what's not in this formula. The period is equal to 2 pi times the length or the, times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by the gravitational acceleration. A couple of things that aren't included in this formula is the amplitude or how far the pendulum swings. Another thing that's not included in this formula is the mass of the weight at the end of the pendulum. So the mass of the weight doesn't matter. It is, the, the period is independent of, of how heavy an object you put at the end of the pendulum. Okay, let's talk about waves. A wave is a disturbance in some type of substance, in some type of medium that moves, that, has, that actually travels. There are a lot of different types of waves. When I say the word wave, the first thing that probably comes into your mind is a wave in the ocean or a wave at the beach. That's a great example of a wave. Um, that's, you know, it's traveling through water. There has to be some kind of disturbance causing that wave to travel. It could be a person in the water. It could be a passing boat. It could be the pull of gravity causing, causing a tide. Um, it could be a shark, so watch out. Uh, there are other types of waves. There are uh, sound waves. We're going to talk a lot more about sound waves later on, but they travel through the air. You can have seismic waves that travel through solid rock. So there are lots of different types of waves. They're pretty much what you're thinking of when you think of the word wave. And what we're going to look at right now are mechanical waves. We're going to look at electromagnetic waves later on, but right now we're looking at mechanical waves. And there's really two things that mechanical waves require. They require some source of a disturbance, so something to cause the wave to travel, and a wave needs some type of medium to travel through. And this applies to mechanical waves, so it'll be a little bit different when we talk about electromagnetic waves. But they need some type of medium, be it uh, water, be it air, be it uh, solid uh, solid materials. All right, and this third bullet point here is just a highfalutin way of saying that whatever is causing the wave and whatever the wave is traveling through have to be connected to each other in some way. That's all that's really saying. 
The other thing that is important to know about waves is that all waves carry energy and momentum with them. One very important feature of a wave that you need to understand is that the wave will travel through a medium, but the medium itself is not necessarily moving with the wave. So if I have a rope that is fixed on one end and I'm holding the other end under tension and I give it a little up and down flick, I can see that there's going to be a wave that's created and that wave is going to travel from the left to the right. So at one moment in time, it might be here, another moment in time, it might be here, and a slightly later moment in time, it might be here. So the wave is traveling from the left to the right, but the rope itself isn't traveling left and right. It's moving up and down with the disturbance with the wave, but it's not traveling left and right. And again, you've probably experienced this yourself. If you've been at the beach and you've been um, floating in the water, you notice that you might bob up and down with the waves, but you're not going to be moving necessarily with the wave. And I'm not talking about standing where the wave is crashing and getting pushed onto the beach. I'm talking about being beyond the point where the waves are crashing and you're just bobbing up and down on a float or something like that. And you're going up and down with the waves, but you're not necessarily moving toward the beach because you are the medium and you're bobbing up and down with the wave, but the wave is what is traveling from the ocean to the beach not the water itself. Okay, there are two types of waves that we are going to look at. The first type is called a transverse wave. And in a transverse wave, the medium is going to move perpendicular to the direction of a wave. A wave in the ocean is a very good example of a transverse wave or flicking a rope or um, Doing something, like that, uh, doing something similar with a slinky or a spring is an example of a transverse wave. In the case that's shown in the photograph, we can see that the medium is being moved up and down. So it's being moved in the vertical direction, yet the wave is traveling in the horizontal direction. So the motion or the disturbance of the medium is up and down, but the uh, the direction of the wave is going to be along my x-axis or to the right. So the, uh, the medium is being disturbed in a motion that is perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave. The second type of wave is called the longitudinal wave. And in a longitudinal wave, the medium is disturbed or the motion, the medium moves parallel to the direction of travel of the wave. So if we have a wave and we kind of bunch it all up, if we have a spring, we kind of bunch it all up at one end and we release it, the medium is going to be disturbed. Hold on, let me get my pen working here. My medium is going to be disturbed, in this case, in the horizontal direction, and the wave is also traveling in a horizontal direction. So they are parallel to one another. So in a longitudinal wave, the medium moves parallel to the direction of the wave. If I wanted to draw a picture of a wave, it would look something like this. And there's just a couple of definitions that I want to go through in this diagram. The first line, which is my brown line in the diagram, is a snapshot of a wave at one particular moment in time. The blue line is the same wave, but taking a moment later or some period of time after the brown line. The highest points of the wave are, hold on, let me just grab a good color here. The highest points of the wave here are called the crests of the wave. The lower points of the wave here, here and here are called troughs. So the highest point of the wave is called a crest. The low part of a wave is called a trough. It's easy to picture a transverse wave as a sine wave because the medium is moving up and down. It's usually how we picture it. And the wave is moving from left to right. So we can see that the, uh, the medium is moving perpendicular to the direction of the wave. But we can picture a longitudinal wave the same way. And when we do that, the areas of a longitudinal wave where the medium is compressed or smushed together would be analogous to a crest of a transverse wave. And the areas where the medium is stretched out would be analogous to the trough of a wave. 
Let's talk about how a wave follows simple harmonic motion. Um, and this is going to be kind of hard to explain. There are a lot of great tools that I use in the classroom to demonstrate this. Um, but let's just see if we can talk this through with just the diagram. Really all we're talking about here is if we have a string and we can put a continuous amount of pulses into the string. In other words, we keep um, in putting pulses into it, we keep wanting to go up and down, up and down, up and down. It's going to cause one long continuous wave in the string. In the example here, we have a blade that is moving up and down. So this blade is moving up and down and it is causing the pulse to go into the string that is shown. Now the blade is following simple harmonic motion, which means that uh, there's always going to be a force wanting to restore the blade to its equilibrium position. And here's my equilibrium position right here. And because that's following simple harmonic motion, every point on the string is also following simple harmonic motion, which means that uh, when the string is displaced from its equilibrium position, so we have this point on the string right here, whoops, let's go right this point on the string right here when it's displaced from the equilibrium position it wants to go back down towards the equilibrium position and when it is displaced right here it's going to want to again restore to its equilibrium position so the string itself is following simple harmonic motion okay another term to define is the amplitude of a wave the amplitude is how far the wave or the medium the wave is traveling through, how far that moves from its equilibrium position. So amplitude is simply the distance from the equilibrium position. And if there's no friction, a, a, a substance is going to be, or I should say a medium, when it's undergoing a simple harmonic motion, is going to always bounce back and forth between a positive displacement from equilibrium to a negative displacement from equilibrium, similar to the masses on the springs that we looked at a few slides ago. Let's take a look at amplitude as it relates to that example that we looked at a couple of slides ago with the wave uh, moving on a spring. We can see that my equilibrium position is the dotted line, or the dashed line, moving horizontally. My positive displacement is going to be from this point, and we'll call that the positive direction. Right, so here's my displacement from the equilibrium to this other displacement in the negative direction. And this positive displacement is going to be the same magnitude as this negative displacement. In other words, the crest and the trough are going to be the same distance from the equilibrium position. The other thing that we want to define here is a wavelength. Wavelength is simply the, the distance between two points on the wave that are behaving the exact same way. We usually measure them from, from crest to crest or from trough to trough. But I can say that from this point, this crest to this crest would be one wavelength. From this trough to this trough, would also be one wavelength. And the symbol that we use for wavelength is the Greek letter lambda. So that is not an upside down Y, it is the Greek letter lambda. One thing to be careful of, we talk about a wavelength being two successive points on the wave that are behaving the exact same way. But if you look at this point here, where the wave is passing the equilibrium point, and this point here where the wave is passing the equilibrium point, they're in the same position, but they're not behaving the same way. Here, the wave or the medium is traveling, whoops, let's see here. The medium is traveling in the downward or toward the negative displacement. And here, the wave is traveling upwards towards the positive displacement. So they're in the same position, but they're not behaving the same way. So be careful of that. We usually like to measure wavelengths from crest to crest or trough to trough because it gets confusing if you try to measure them from the equilibrium position. Let's talk about period and frequency. The period is the amount of time it takes for a wave to tr make one complete cycle. In other words, to go from a crest to a crest or from a trough to a trough. So a wave would have to start at one crest, go all the way down to a trough and then come all the way back up to the next crest. That is a period. We again measure those in seconds. 
the frequency of a wave is the number of complete cycles that a wave will make in one, uh, one specific amount of time. And we usually measure them in um, cycles per second or hertz. And we'll talk about hertz in a little bit. So my uh, formula for the frequency is the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the period. So the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the period. Or I could say that the frequency is the reciprocal of the period, which also means that the period is the, the reciprocal of the frequency. So if you have the period and you want to know the frequency, just take the inverse or the reciprocal of the period and vice versa for the frequency. The speed of a wave is measured by multiplying the frequency of the wave times the wavelength. So the velocity or speed of a wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. And if we take a look at our formula here, V equals F times lambda, this is actually the same thing as our, um, as our regular velocity formula. Remember we say that velocity is equal to distance divided by time. Those two are actually the same formula. Now you might be saying, well, my time component in this formula is in the denominator. Here it's not. But remember, the frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So remember, the frequency is equal to 1 over the period. And my period is in seconds. So I can say just in terms of units that the frequency is 1 over a second which we also call, as I mentioned before, we also use as a hertz, or we could just say second to the minus first power. So when we have the frequency in the numerator here, it's the same thing as having the time in the denominator because the frequency is the inverse of the period. I want to spend the next couple of slides talking about how waves interfere with one another. If I have two waves that are traveling in the same medium, those two waves can actually intersect and pass through one another without altering either of the waves. So if you have, for example, two people who are jumping into the pool at the same time, hopefully six feet apart, but you're jumping into the pool at the same time, each person is going to create a wave or disturbance in the water. Those waves at some point are going to intersect with one another and they are going to pass through each other and then they're going to continue moving on in their original direction. And waves will obey something called the superposition principle, which sounds fancy, but really all that means is that when the two waves intersect with one another, the size of the wave at the point where they intersect is going to be equal to the sum of the displacements of each of those waves. So again, I have two waves that are going to pass through each other. The point where they pass each other is going to create a wave that is going to be the sum of the amplitudes of the individual waves. Now remember, waves can either have amplitudes in the positive direction if it's going toward a crest or in the negative direction if it's going towards a trough. So sometimes the um, sometimes the original wave will be bigger depending on where um, where the individual waves are in terms of being in a crest or a trough, and we'll talk about that next. Let's talk about constructive interference. If I have two waves that are traveling, they have the same period and the same frequency, and the crest of one wave lines up with the crest of another wave, and if that happens, the trough of one wave, whoops, here we go, the trough of one wave will line up with the trough of the other wave. When that happens, we say that those waves are in phase with one another. In other words, the crests line up with each other and the troughs line up with each other. When they interfere with each other, the combined wave is going to have a frequency that, or an amplitude rather, that is going to be the sum of the amplitudes of both of those waves. So it's going to have an amplitude that is greater than the two, the two initial waves. Let's look at an example of constructive interference. If we have a string and we have two waves that are, that are traveling in opposite directions to one another, so in the uh, first part of the diagram here, we have 
two waves, a smaller wave traveling to the right and a larger wave traveling to the left. When the two waves meet, we're going to have the crest of both of those waves intersect with one another. Now, the amplitude is different, but we still have a crest interfering or intersecting with a crest. When that happens, we see in part C of the diagram that we get one resulting wave where the amplitude of that resulting wave is greater than the amplitude of the first two waves because it's the sum of the amplitudes of the two initial waves. And it's going to be just for that, inter that moment where those two waves intersect. After they intersect, we see that the waves separate. And in the last part of the diagram, we see the waves are continuing to travel in the original direction of their motion. So they've just passed through one another. Note that the, um, uh, the waves, after they've passed through each other, I just wanted to make this point, after they've passed through each other, they go back to having their original amplitude. So they're not changed by interfering with one another. Let's take a look at destructive interference in a wave. If I, if I have two waves, like I did before, but now they're going to be what we say is 180 degrees out of phase with one another. And what that simply means is that I have two, I have two waves here. The crest of wave A is going to line up with the trough of wave B. And the trough of wave A is going to line up with the crest of wave B. If the two waves have the same amplitude and the same frequency, in other words, if they both have the same displacement from equilibrium and they both are undergoing the same number of cycles per second, when the two waves combine with one another, they are going to cancel each other out. Because let's say, for example, that the amplitude here was 10 centimeters. That should be a 10. And this amplitude would be 10 centimeters. This would be a positive 10 plus a negative 10 is going to equal zero. And that's going to be true at every point on the wave. So the two waves are going to cancel each other out. Let's take a look and see how uh, destructive interference works on two waves traveling on a string. Just as we have before, we have two waves traveling in opposite directions. But in this case, we have the crest of one wave is going to meet the trough of another wave. And when those two waves meet or where they intersect, the resulting wave is going to be smaller because we are actually taking a positive amplitude and adding it to a negative amplitude. So that's going to give me a smaller value. And note that after the two waves pass one another, they remain unchanged. They are going to continue moving on in their original direction with the same amplitude that they had before they intersected. The last couple of slides, I just want to talk about how waves are reflected. I'm not going to go too deep into this. just want to give you guys uh, just a real general and quick overview of how waves reflect. If I have a wave traveling on a string and one end of that string is fixed to a boundary of some type, so the wave is, or the string is actually fixed in position here. It can't move in, uh, in relation to whatever it is attached to. If I have a pulse or a wave traveling down that string, when it reaches the boundary, it's going to want to reflect back in the opposite direction. And when it reflects back, it's going to be inverted or it's going to be a mirror image of the original wave. So if the end is fixed, the reflected wave is inverted. That's pretty much all I want you to get from this part. If I have a reflected wave, but the string that the wave is traveling along is not attached to the boundary or to whatever the uh, the wave is going to reflect off of, if it's free to move along that boundary. So in this uh, in this example, we have the string is attached to a ring around the pole here. So it's free to move up and down along the pole. So the end of the string is not fixed. When the wave reflects off of the boundary, because the string is not fixed to the boundary, the reflected wave is not going to be inverted. So again, uh, if the end of it is under the wave or string is not fixed, the reflected wave will not be inverted. That's all I want you to know for that part of it. 
that does it for vibrations and waves. I hope you've enjoyed watching this as much as I've enjoyed making it. Hope you've enjoyed it more than I've enjoyed making it actually. Uh, but as always, if you have any questions at all, shoot me an email, join one of the Google Hangouts, or just ask somebody who knows more about physics than I do. Although Mr. Broderick um, probably isn't going to be answering his emails anymore, but you never know. Give it a try, but send me an email if you have any questions. We'll see you next time.